the, for the invitation to share together with you our knowledge, our idea, and our Italian experience together with Ettore, of course. So, as you know, I think that uh, until uh, 2000, arthroscopic surgery in the, in the majority of the cases have reached and exceeded open surgery in the treatment of uh, shoulder stability. As you can see here in uh, Formula One, no? But uh, as you can see here, Steve showed in the same case, especially in association to bony lesions, that it is uh, to go out of track sometimes when, uh, is, uh, when you go uh, too much with too much speed. And uh, especially if you see this uh, very famous paper from uh, Steve Burkhardt, you know, you can note that 14... Pardon? You can see that 14 of uh, 25, 21 recurrences was caused by significant bone defect in the form of anterior inferior glenoid bone loss and large sex uh, defects, as you know. So there was something that uh, uh, wasn't enough understood that uh, before 2000 for arthroscopic uh, um, repair. As you can see here, you can uh, use uh, the CT scan to evaluate uh, the, the glenoid defect and the bony and the heel sacs defect. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, methods to understand the depth and the sites of the, the glenoid defect. And, uh, but we have the same, the same problem if, you, if we have uh, this kind of view, if you, if you can see here with the Sugaya method in Italy, we use the PICO method that was realized by uh, Paolo Baldi, that is a, a very famous uh, surgeon in Italy. And uh, if you can see here, at the beginning of the literature, the cutoff uh, was 21% or 25% about the glenoid side, as you can see here, of the, about the anterior inferior glenoid critical defect. And what about the critical humeral defect? We have to talk about engaging in sacs. This is an arthroscopic view of an, an engaging in sacs when you perform an upper position. So that means an abdu in the, when your arm is in a deduction and external rotation in the space, the arm is a, a is abducted and uh, the, the humeral head is uh, dislocated in the anterior inferior space. We have to talk about in, the, in our presentations about a lot of uh, techniques that were realized like uh, to deal with these defects, like remplissage technique that was uh, published the first time in 2004 by Wolf and Pollack. But uh, uh, we, have, uh, we will have uh, two more presentations to talk about this kind of technique. These were, these are, uh, this is our publications about our uh, very good results that we have had after, um, after we adopted this kind of technique. We started in 2007, and I really believe in this, uh, um, this adjunct to the bunker repair. This is uh, one of the first uh, algorithm of treatment that was realized about in 2000 by Arciero that was uh, uh, very followed by a lot of surgeons all over the world. And uh, when in, uh, a, in a human head is uh, dislocated is, and uh, um, once is uh, engaged, as you can see here, but if you repair, as you can see here, by published in this paper, if you repair a bunker lesion, after the repair, you, you, you can try to dislocate again uh, the humeral head that uh, maybe has a, a heel sacs lesion, but only 7% of these heel sacs are really engaged, engaging after the repair, as you can see here. So something is, uh, is not uh, understood in our uh, in our technique. This is the reason because uh, we have to start to think to bipolar problem, as you can see here. That is not uh, a psychiatric uh, disease, of course, 
as you can as you as you well know but uh, we have to think uh, to combine the two defects the human head defect and the glenoid defect this is the um, very famous uh, publications uh, a publication that belongs to to three very famous authors that described the combination of these two defects and uh, it's very important to understand this because uh, uh, it's different the philosophy uh, that you have to approach to um, a, per, a procedure. This was uh, the time to introduce uh, friends of us, uh, big friends of everybody. Uh, that was uh, A.G. Toy, as you can see here, that uh, introduced the concept of uh, um, glenoid truck. That is the contact between the glenoid and the human head in a bead action, external rotation, an extension. As you can see here in these, uh, uh, in these drawings, uh, this is the glenoid track that usually uh, amount when you have uh, an intact glenoid without a glenoid defect to 84%. But if you have a, sign a significant or not significant glenoid defect, this glenoid track will decrease. So the treatment algorithm that was showed uh, by these, true, these three authors and uh, the whole uh, AG toy is this. And uh, these are more drawings uh, from him that uh, will show better the situation. If you can see here, if you have, please, if you have an intact glenoid, and you have an ill sex, you have to compare these two defects. And you have, if you have an intact glenoid and you have an ill sex in the glenoid track, this is on track glenoid and the lesion, the glenoid, the human head lesion, it stays on the track. However, like in this case, if you have a big glenoid defect, the hill sacs fracture, the hill sacs lesion is not on the track and is off track and you have more chance to dislocate the human head. In this other case, the hill sacs lesion is more medial, as you can see here, and so is off track and you have more chances to dislocate the human head. The same problem you have if you have a, a very huge hill sacs, huge and above all deep hill sacs that uh, exceed the glenoid track. So this was the, the treatment algorithm that uh, was uh, proposed in uh, 2014 by A.G. Itoi, Itoi, as you can see here. And he say he suggests a bunker to repair if you have a glenoid defect uh, less than 25% and an yield sacs on track. Of course, this uh, percentage of uh, critical glenoid defect has changed during the time from uh, 2014 until now, till now. But this uh, was the starting point, and I would like to show you because uh, we can have uh, some. Uh, sharp ideas about the, the, the treatment, uh, the atroscopic treatment or not. Uh, this is some uh, uh, little videos uh, that shows the, the procedure, as you can see here, it's uh, the first time is uh, to detach the remaining, remaining tissue from the glenoid with uh, some uh, uh, instruments, it is insertion of the suture anchor, this is a video of uh, two or three years ago when uh, I still used uh, bioabsorbable uh, and associated to biomaterial anchors. And now I'm, I'm using above all suture anchors with a spectrum uh, or uh, the way you prefer, you can uh, take some tissue from the lab room and uh, retrieve the suture with uh, a shuttle. And at the end, we can make uh, the traditional note to ensure the labrum to the glenoid. So at this point, you can say that I'm stupid. Why? Because uh, I didn't uh, 
um, didn't say, didn't remind to you the IC score, as you can see here. But uh, you had to remind and to keep attention to a fact, very important, that uh, this instability salary index score uh, was really very important, but uh, it didn't take into consideration something that uh, I would like to highlight that uh, was before then 2007 when Wolf published Rempissage Technique. I think that after this uh, data and after this um, period uh, with the Rempissage, our results were really improved and uh, help us to avoid uh, um, too many uh, useless lethargy. Why I don't use um, in all the all the, all the on all of my cases lethargy because uh, I prefer to use this, to use lethargy only when I need. This is the indications, of course, of uh, aging, as you can see here. Yeah. He used lethargy and bone block or bone block only when he has uh, uh, glenoid defect more than 25 percent associated of uh, associated to an its lesion of truck. At this point, I would like to show this uh, photo that uh, uh, combined two friends of mine, uh, above all Gilles Vash, where uh, I stayed and I learned a lot of, from him, above all the, uh, the open lethargy technique that I, anyway, I love. But now I have to, <laughs> to for, forget this, uh, this friend and uh, to talk uh, more uh, about uh, La Fosse because uh, I am trying to, to shift, to, to move to arthroscopic procedure since uh, um, six months because I really believe that uh, the new procedure, especially in the Italian way that was realized by a friend of mine, Roberto Castricini, on mine and uh, surely uh, of Taverna, at Torre Taverna, that show a third way of uh, performing the Arthur Latarge with the button instead, uh, uh, instead screws. That is really a safer technique. I don't want, I didn't, I don't want to mention, of course, ESA and Bone Block that uh, was described by Ettore that uh, I think uh, they are useful uh, in a range from 10 to 20 with other with this indication, but above all, because I think that Ettore will be really useful to explain these two technique and uh, indication for this kind of technique. So thank you very much. This is my first presentation. And if you have uh, some question about it, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Franceschi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, is there any question to Dr. Franceschi on his talk? Sanjay Trivedi, Chirag Kulse. Dr. Francesco? Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, buenos dias. Ciao. Uh, why have you shifted from uh, open uh, GILS procedure to uh, arthroscopy? I move to, this is a good question. This is, I moved from, from open to arthroscopic because uh, I didn't have a sincerely failure or a recurrence rate or, or big complication rate. Sincerely, I was really very satisfied about open procedure. But uh, I think that uh, in our uh, practice, we had to go on. And uh, since and until the techniques was uh, realized with screws. And uh, uh, I think that the screws are really more invasive than the technique that I use now, uh, using now. I, I didn't try to, to start with this technique. Now with this new technique that we show you in the third presentation, I'm really more uh, confident because uh, I use a button and uh, uh, it's almost like uh, the same that we show Ettore with uh, bone block. I think that uh, this is, uh, these are uh, safer 
fixation means and uh, above all you have the chance to use uh, a posterior guide that uh, will, will guide your tunnels for the suture really parallel to the glenoid uh, surface. Instead, uh, um, with the screws, uh, you, you, you know that you can have uh, more problem with the tilt, with the angulation of the, of the screws, especially if you are at the beginning of your, uh, of your car learning curve. I think that uh, these techniques, uh, this technique with button is uh, affordable by uh, an absolute beginner of uh, atroscopic latarge without uh, major complications. Uh, Dr. Franceschi, I just wanted to ask you regarding your decision-making in traumatic instability. So when do you decide to do only bank art? When do you decide to do add the ramplissage? And when do you decide to do that this patient is going to require the uh, latage? Is there any guideline or you still follow the same old IC screw? As I showed you before in my presentation, I don't use uh, IC score because it's too invasive for me. I am really a believer of uh, arthroscopic surgery, and uh, I used to perform this kind of surgery in the, in the most of the time. Maybe was uh, the reason because I started with my arthroscopic latarge experience. My uh, guidelines, my personal. Uh, um, algorithm of treatment is uh, to use uh, only uh, bank art repair when you don't have uh, an ill sax lesion at first. But in the most of the time when I, I have to deal with the bipolar defect, so with a glenoid defect and uh, a minimal glenoid defect, of course, not big, uh, de big uh, glenoid defect, and uh, an ill sax. I'm very happy to perform both, both procedure contemporarily, bank art repair and remplissage repair. I really have to say that uh, I, I am really very satisfied and I really decrease my, percent, my recurrence rate percentage after introducing remplissage repair. I use uh, Arthroscopic latarge now only when I have a big glenoid defect. More than uh, for me, it's uh, more than 15%. And when I have a contact sport uh, athlete. Okay. Any any question to Doctor? Yeah. Uh, can Francesco? I ask, Roshan? Yes. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, Mr. Francesca, Doctor Franceschi, do you have any problem with the remplissage? And if not then why don't you use it for every bank cut? I sincerely, I didn't have had, uh, any problem with the remplissage technique. Uh, after I will show you what I mean, because I published uh, about it and uh, I, I, found, I found in the literature a lot of uh, authors that, uh, are, uh, that agree with me. I didn't have had uh, any problem about uh, the external rotation, why? Because uh, if you perform only a bank card repair and you compare bank card repair with um, bank card repair to remplis um, plus remplissage, you can have the same rate of loss of external rotation. The secret is to start as soon as possible with the rehabilitation, especially with sleeper stretch that use uh, to enlarge the, um, the capsule. And sincerely, I didn't have uh, any problem. Another thing that I had to say maybe is that uh, I need to perform remplissage with only one anchor because I really think that two anchors and uh, uh, double pulley technique is uh, too invasive for the posterior capsule. Maybe this is my secret. But then why don't you use it for every bank card repair? Pardon? Why don't you use a remplissage for every bank cards? I use a remplissage only when I have a little, maybe little or, or major uh, heel sax lesion. But if you don't have any heel sax lesion, it's not mandatory to perform remplissage. 
you can you need only bank card to repair if you have a good capsule if uh, the patient is not a contact outlet so um, it's uh, the minimum i have had a lot of uh, success with uh, my my patients with only with bank card repair above all because you have to think that uh, arthroscopic treatment is an anatomic treatment and uh, our goal is to perform this treatment uh, as as, a, as soon as possible, not uh, the second, third recurrence, because uh, after uh, three or two recurrence, you will uh, find uh, an awful capsule, as you as you know. So, uh, Dr. Franceschi, there are two questions here. One is what, according to you right now, in current date, what is your critical bone loss or else what is your threshold to shift from a, from a soft tissue procedure to a bony procedure? Sorry, but I, I didn't uh, hear very well. Would you like to repeat? Yeah, what is your threshold for a critical bone loss? Oh, okay, my threshold, uh, usually is uh, 15 uh, 15 percent but uh, usually i compare to the activity of the patient because if uh, the patient is sedentary um, is a, a sedentary worker is not a manual worker is not uh, a contact outlet uh, i think that uh, my threshold will increase to 20 20 20 percent but you don't have only to look at the glenoid. You have to look both glenoid and humeral side. Yeah, you did tell us that your ISIS score doesn't uh, hold good for you. So what are your predictors for a high-risk patient? Like how do you predict uh, a high-risk candidate for you? Um, which is my ideal candidate for... Um, um, atroscopic repair, you mean? Yes. I think that uh, my ideal candidate is uh, a non-contact outlet, of course, and um, the, the extent of the defect is uh, not more about the glenoid, not more 15%, and not more than 20% of the humeral side and only one or two recurrence rate. This, uh, this idea before the procedure, of course, but if you are in, your, in the shoulder during the arthroscopic surgery and you realize that the condition of the capsule are really bad or you have more problems, this is an advantage to have the chance to be able to perform an arthroscopic lethargy because you are able to move to a more complete procedure. Yeah. Any other questions from the house? Uh, Mr. Franceschi, Dr. Rajkumar here from Bangalore. Hello. Uh, hello, good evening. Um, I am very happy that uh, you have uh, uh, you know, categorically said that you uh, don't practice lethargy for all cases. We appreciate that. Uh, did you in your any case find out that when you're doing remplissage, or even for off-track lesions, was there any limitation of range of movement of the shoulder? And if so, why? Okay, as I said to you before, I really believe that uh, the limitation of range of motion after Olympic surgery repair is not significant the most of the time. Why? Because if you compare two populations of patients that received the first population bunker repair, the second population heel sacs remplissage plus bunker repair, you will find the same external rotation, almost the same rota external rotation deficit. If you instead compare remplissage, bank art repair plus remplissage population in the, in the same population, both side, you can find really 
a defect of um, uh, external rotation. Okay, I don't know if you are feel uh, are understand me. Why I I am saying that because uh, there are too many uh, papers in literature that uh, comparing you um, affected sites to normal sites and this uh, this is not a, a right way to understand the 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 problem for me yeah dr devin i mean uh, dr franceschi that was uh, that is i think so that that could put an end to the discussions of the first talk yeah uh, anybody else would uh, like to place in any questions please type yeah, chirak can may i ask yes yes sir yeah if uh, 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 dr franceschi if there is a bone loss more than 25% your option will be arthroscopic lethargy or you will do something else uh, arthroscopic lethargy or some or you, will you go for uh, bone block procedure or no. something else more than 25% if uh, bone loss is there now my my actual trend is to perform arthroscopic lethargy plus remplissage after i will show you because uh, you have to think that it's almost impossible to find 25% the glenoid effect without an without an ilsax effect so if you combine both the technique i think and i will uh, i will i would like to demonstrate this with this, uh, with a paper that uh, it's enough to to deal with this kind of problem okay i i have one question before we uh, wind up the session here so we all know that uh, the engaging hill shacks is is by literature over reported and it actually has to be reported after we feature the bank cards and then the head is engaging or no so that that now we say that it's only 7% of these bipolar defects are actually engaging rather than 30% is there any way we can assess pre op or only intraoperatively we help after suturing the bank cards will address it also you have a, a a formula that was published in the in the paper that uh, of uh, AG Giovanni Di Giacomo and Steve Burkert uh, that is useful to understand if uh, the defects are on track of track at first but uh, sincerely i have to say that uh, uh, all even if uh, the defect is uh, off track i am very happy to perform latarge uh, to perform sorry a uh, remplissage because uh, you have um, and help to your uh, procedure and sincerely as i said to you before i'm, I'm really very satisfied to the range of motion that my patient uh, recover after the operation so I, i'm not really uh, frightened about this kind of procedure okay i think uh, we should move on to the next talk chirag Can you invite Dr. Ito Taverna, my very good friend from Italy, and he is a wonderful researcher uh, who has work tremendous work on instability. Dr. Taverna. Dr. Taverna, can you start your uh, screen sharing? Ito, can you hear me? you have to unmute yourself oh hello okay dr yeah. taverna uh, just yeah. just open your open your presentation on your desktop yeah. and then then you can start the sh uh, share screen okay 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 can you can you can you see that can you hear me first of all Yeah, we can hear you. I'll just mute everyone in a second. Okay, here. Okay, and and you can see all my my slides. Yes. Okay, great. So I'll just so, mute all. I'll unmute you. Okay, you can proceed with your. 
presentation. Okay, so, so thank you, thank you, Roshan, and uh, thank you to all uh, Indian friends, and of course, uh, Ciao to Francesco. I heard uh, the interesting talk. So now we go back a little bit uh, on uh, biomechanical and uh, diagnostic uh, findings for uh, unstable shoulder. So uh, we know very well that uh, the biomechanics of uh, unstable shoulder depends a lot on bone defects. And this is well known uh, since many years because uh, we have a paper of 2002 that showed that we select a patient with no bone defect. Our soft tissue repair, we can call it banca repair, but of course, uh, any kind of uh, shifting of capsule and ligament uh, can have good results on short or long term with uh, absolutely acceptable uh, recurrence rate less than 5%. So, we know that uh, if we have patients with uh, uh, shoulder instability and no bone defects, our soft tissue arthroscopic techniques are valid. At the same time, at that time, we were neglecting very much uh, the bone defects. And so most of us and most of uh, the arthroscopic pioneers of uh, shoulder instability, they were doing bunker repair, capsular shift without selecting the patient. And you know the first paper that uh, showed that very clearly was uh, the Burkhardt the Beer paper showing that uh, if they were treating rugby players uh, with no bone defects, they have a very good uh, recurrence rate. But with bone defect, the recurrence rate was close to seventy percent. So they understood first that this was unacceptable. And the biomechanical relationship is very simple. Uh, there is an inverse relationship be between bony defects and stability. The higher is the, and the larger is the bone defect, and the less stable is the shoulder. This looks uh, uh, absolutely clear now, but uh, was not like this uh, maybe 20 years ago. The basic rules of glenar humor stability are that the joint does not dislocate until the humor head articular net force reaction is directed uh, uh, towards the effective art of the glenoid and the humeral head remains center in the glenoid uh, if the articular surfaces are congruent. So we know that uh, we're looking at this, it's important, you know, the bony support of the glenoid, it's important the action of the muscles and the ligaments, of course, for keeping the head inside that. And there is this angle, um, which is uh, uh, very important, that uh, is the angle of stability of uh, of the humeral head inside the, the glenoid that is kept, of course, by the integrity of the bony restriction of the joint and, of course, the action of the soft tissue. And uh, the, F, the effective arc of the glenoid is uh, the, the arc uh, of bone capable for sustaining humeral head articular net force reaction. So when we move the shoulder, uh, this arc should uh, uh, keep the humeral head in position. And of course, it's clear now, if we have a, a little bony erosion of the glenoid or on the other side on the humor head, uh, this arc diminishes a lot. And uh, the uh, angle of stability also changes a lot. Of course, also uh, the labrum and the soft tissue gives stability and uh, uh, there are bi biomechanical studies showing that the absence of the glenoid labrum reduces the stability quotient by 20%. So, what we did uh, until the 2000, more or less, was good because uh, repairing the labrum, repairing the, restoring the capsule and the ligament gives stability to, to the shoulder. The problem was that we were not considering the bony lesion. And you know, three millimeter defects of the anterior glenoid reduces the stability angle by more than 25%. And three millimeter uh, defects, that sounds very little, is about, 18% of uh, the average of uh, the glenoid size on the population. So really, it's not necessary to have huge bony defect for having an um, unstable shoulder. So before how to manage and to assess this, it's important to understand how frequent are these uh, bone defects. And they're really frequent in the paper of 2003 by Edwards and Walsh showed on six, uh, 160 uh, unstable sh shoulder study that up to 90% of uh, this shoulder, they have some kind of bone defects, either on the glenoid or the humor head. So what uh, I, I was hearing uh, many years ago, because I think I was uh, among the first, 
saying that we need to consider we needed to consider bone defects in term for repairing unstable shoulder especially when i was giving this talk in us uh, we don't see bone defect you don't see bone defect if you don't look for them because as i said as, as i showed three millimeters is really easy to miss especially arthroscopically viewing but it's significant and uh, uh, also another study by Sugaya showed that uh, in unstable shoulder only 10 percent so same results same same percent were with no bony defects so of course bone defects are frequent on a stable shoulder then we have to decide uh, if they are significant or not but we know that there are and we look we need to look for them because we need to look for the morphology meaning that not all the bone defects are bone erosion are bone loss sometimes we have bony bankers so uh, we can repair it so we have to localize the bone defect because as we have seen, and it's very well known now, we have either on the glenoid side and the humeral head. And then determining the size is also important to decide. And uh, looking at the glenoid, we know that we have uh, the bony banker, meaning that we can still have the piece of bone attached to the, to the labrum ligament. We have the piece of bone detached and reattach more medially and the, the ligaments uh, detach it. Uh, I think this kind of bony banker is really uh, good to repair it, especially in acute or subacute patients, because they can heal and we can do a very simple procedure effective. This, most of the time, at least in my patients, are more chronic cases, and then the classical repair in my hands doesn't work very well. And this is another kind of patient where we have a fracture of the glenoid that are not that unusual, and uh, I think those, th those uh, lesions can be repaired. And so if we look at the literature, we knew since many years ago, before 2000, there were so all, all different variations of bony problem. And so how to then identify bone loss? I think first of all, when I have a patient coming to my office with uh, unstable shoulders saying that uh, I had two, three or plus number of uh, recurrent dislocation, I want to know if we have a glenoid bone loss. And the simplest thing to do to know if there is a, a bone loss is to do an AP view, the real AP view x-ray. So something very simple, published and, uh, by uh, Gerber and popularized by Gerber in 2006, many years ago. It's very sensitive. And when there is no uh, the, uh, there is the loss of the subchondral sclerosis. Here there is the sclerosis from top to bottom, and here is interrupted here. And here there is no sclerosis. We know from this that there is a bone defect on the glenoid. So I do this x-ray study, and then I look for uh, other, other information. Of course, the interruption can be like this, and we know from a simple x-ray that we have a bony bunker here. Here we have uh, the type two bony banker that I showed you before. And so, you know, doing x-ray, we have a lot of information. Of course, even a simple CT scan can give us more information regarding this. And we know this from many years. A study of the De Wilde, which is a Belgian guy, uh, showed that it was, uh, it's possible to design a circumference in the lower part of every glenoid despite the shape of the glenoid. And this was prodromic for uh, several studies and, um, and uh, uh, methods to calculate the glenoid bone loss, which is very important. There was uh, the Sugaya publication, 2003, with a 3D CT scan showing how precise we can be for bony bankers or also for bone loss, measuring the size, comparing the uh, healthy side with the uh, affected side. And so we could calculate the, the, the percent of the bone loss. Uh, is it an excellent method? Probably the most precise. Um, it's not so easy to have a 3D CT scan and a radiologist uh, in every hospital all over the world to do this because you cannot do that after the exam has been done. There was another publication by uh, Willems in 2006 showing that basically we can do something like this also with the MRI but this is definitely more less precise 
And uh, there was Paolo Baudi, Francesco talk, talked about him uh, earlier, which is an Italian guy who did uh, this uh, study, I mean, uh, created this method with this the multiplanar reconstruction of the simple CT scan for studying the, the glenoid bone erosion. And you see here a review paper of 2017 <laughs> saying that the PICO method is to date the most reproducible, precise, and accurate method for measuring glenoid bone loss. I was following this method since the beginning because I found that it was simple and was uh, uh, feasible to do that even if the patient would come with already with a CT scan to your office and you can do that later. And I was calculating all my patients with this method and I'm happy to know that now it's still considered one of the most precise. This is a very simple method and uh, you can have uh, the, the, the multiplanar reconstruction of, uh, of the glenoid in, in terms of to have a face view of the healthy side, and then you compare the area of the healthy side with the affected side. And this is really not complicated and actually looks it that is also a very precise. And uh, most of my patients with multiple dislocation, they have this kind of image, which is not the inverted pair. Uh, we can observe sometimes inverted pair, but I think maybe Burkhardt and the beer, the beer they were looking, they were, they were seeing many inverted pair because uh, they have to face mainly with a special population of uh, unstable shoulder rugby players or, or American football players. Uh, in Europe, they are not so common, this uh, patient, but we have patients with multiple dislocation. And most of my patients with multiple dislocation, they have this straight glenoid that in most cases is about between 15, 18%, something like that. If you do a uh, soft tissue repair, even if you have a uh, on, on track uh, heel sacs lesion in, on this, most of my patients, they were really dislocating. That's why before 2005, I didn't want to do banker repair or soft tissue repair on these patients because I knew they were really dislocating. And then all the literature in the more recent years showed that uh, I was uh, right. And uh, of course, not only bone defects are, you know, uh, bone loss. If we have uh, the, still the piece of bone there, the piece of bone there is not chronic, it's good to repair it with uh, an arthroscopy. So not all the bone defects are feasible for uh, latarge or other bony procedures, because now we have uh, a really wide a spectrum of bony procedures that are not only latarge, and we cannot talk about latarge, in my opinion, anymore, because there are latargets, plural, because there are so many ways to do that. And, you know, personally, I also published and created at least a couple of variations. Uh, also, the, the last one with uh, Roberto Castricini was uh, my idea, and we created that uh, together. Anyway. We have uh, to know if the piece of bone is disappeared, is still there. We need to um, know the position like this, like an inverted pair or in front, which is most cases. If the piece of bone is there and is vital or not, because if it's a chronic uh, bony bunker, uh, even if you repair it, probably you won't have a good, good repair. So we need to get used to this image of M-phase, L-phase uh, glenoid, which is really very helpful because uh, after you've seen uh, several, you just look at the image at the end, you don't need to calculate if it's 15, 18, 20, 22. You know that when we have a, a bone loss on the anterior glenoid, the anterior glenoid is no more convex here, it's straight or something like this, it's gonna be unstable. And so this is my practice. And this is why we see all these patients with the suture anchor repair with a, a straight glenoid that they had recurrence. Because even if the procedure was well performed, uh, the, the indication was wrong. And so we need to know that uh, uh, on these patients, we need to do different techniques. We will, I will talk later, and Francesco will talk later about uh, uh, how to fix uh, this uh, patients. It, this was just uh, something regarding biomechanic. Regarding biomechanic, 
we also know that uh, the, the bone is on both sides of the shoulder. So we have a glenoid, we have humeral head. Heel sacs lesions are very common. Could be uh, wide, can be lateral, can be medial. But when we have a heel sacs, for sure, stability of the, of the shoulder would diminish. Um, as Francesco said, I think it's a very brilliant way to calculate if it's on track, off track. I think for my normal practice, I, I almost never followed that because I think it's complicated. For me, what is really important is the location of the heel sacs. If it's really lateral, close to the bare area, I know that maybe a remplissage could be a solution. But if it's more central, remplissage is no more indicated. And those are the most unstable shoulder. So if you do banker and remplissage when the heel sac is not here, but it's here, I think you do a wrong thing, a wrong choice. So this is something very important. That's why I think if we have a heel sac, it's important to know to have a, a 3D CT scan reconstruction, especially for locating the position. We know that the most the, the heel sacs goes towards the center of the humeral head, the more unstable is the shoulder. So if you have this, and we have also 10% uh, glenoid bone erosion, maybe if you do all the calculation is what they call now subcritical area, but I know they're going to redislocate it, especially if uh, they are young people, active, not necessarily with contact sport uh, uh, part participants. And so we know that uh, uh, we need to look for a uh, humeral head and uh, glenoid bony uh, defects because they are important for shoulder stability. Of course, we, we know that it is not the only thing. We have uh, uh, many other factors that uh, I think should be calculated. So I agree that maybe easy score is a little biased score for saying that we have to do latage in all the patient. But I think uh, the score itself depends the way you read it. Uh, but I think it's important to follow a little bit. Anyway, my glenoid track was postulated many years ago, much more than publication. But what we know from all this study is that uh, the most important thing is the position of this. The more is central and the less stable is going to be the shoulder. And this is a very important concept. And that's why it's important to do a, a very uh, accurate preoperative study coming from our, our biomechanical uh, information. We know that it's not just because we want to be precise or we, we want to be uh, we want to support one technique compared to the another. We know that this lesion really would, would be our guidance for finding the good procedure. And I would like to say once more, doesn't exist only Bancard or Bancard plus remplissage et latage. This is really an old point of view because uh, shoulder instability, now we have a much larger choices for fixing even in an anatomical way, unstable shoulder with bone defects. Anyway, I showed you the, all this imaging just because uh, you know that uh, after you see this a few times, look at this. This is not 21, 25%. This is about 18%. You look at the image, I know how much is that. I can compare the area with the healthy side. It's not strictly necessary. For me, when I see this, I know that I should do a bony procedure and then for me, it doesn't matter if it's 20, 25, or 30 to decide if I want to do a bone block or a latage because there is the, exactly the same indication. The difference are the soft tissues. So it doesn't matter if the bone defense is big or, 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 or mild. Uh, latage and bone block are, have the same indication. The difference is the history of the patient. Chronic cases, bad soft tissue, probably non-anatomical procedure are better. Uh, acute, subacute, and then I will show you later my algorithm for treating this patient. So in conclusion, when we have engaging off-track lesion like this, in my opinion, most of the time is a combination of bipolar uh, uh, bone defect. So not necessarily 21, 21, 25. I don't think it's so important to strictly calculate it uh, if it's on track, off track. If we have bipolar uh, bony lesion, I think uh, uh, bankard or soft tissue repair only or uh, with uh, remplissage in addition probably is an under treatment of this patient.
And so when we have uh, in, to face traumatic shoulder instability, in conclusion for me, it's necessary to study the glenohumeral bone defects. So to have a diagnostic algorithm for looking for glenoid and humeral bone defects if there are. I think PICO method is useful for the glenoid side and 3D uh, CT scan reconstruction is very useful for um, uh, determining the position of the um, Hillsax lesion. And this is my diagnostic algorithm I published years ago and I think is still valid. So X-ray first with a true AP view. It's also good to do a Bernajo, but it's more difficult to find and uh, especially in, in countries that are not France, uh, most radiologists, they don't do this fine. But this is simple and uh, it's feasible in every part of the world. And then when we have a bone loss or bony erosion on the interior glenoid, to calculate the area, I think it's useful. I do pick a method, CT scan, simple, but these two methods could work the same, but I choose this. And in yellow, I do this if I have a heel sax because I want to know the position of the heel sax. And then uh, the discussion, what is uh, the percent of bone loss breakpoint for doing soft tissue or bony procedure? To date, there is no uh, consensus in the world. Depends where you are. If you are in France, probably bony procedure all the time. This is a big road. Other part of the world, maybe the biggest road is this. I think we need to discuss better and to know better. Anyway, I know that starting 2000, we're saying 30% of glenoid for bony procedure. But then if you look just the literature, you see 2002 was reducing this uh, to 25%. And then uh, it to a 20%. 2016, they were reducing again to uh, this position. And this is a review paper of 2017 concluding that if the surgeon are still using 25% of the glenoid width as the cutoff for once you perform a bony reconstruction, rather than 10 or 15%, this can explain the high recurrence rate we have in our patient treating shoulder instability. And I totally agree. Uh, I also follow easy score because I think it's, uh, it's important to know if we have a patient that in addition to bony prob problems can have a, a, a risk to recurrence. So age is important. The younger is the patient, the more unstable is going to be the, sh the shoulder. And definitely if the uh, hyper, hyper laxity is another factor of risk for recurrence and competition in collision sports. So I put together all this information and then I decide my treatment. And so in conclusion, we can say that the reason for failure of shoulder stabilization can be glenoid bone defect and humeral bone defect that they're not very well uh, calculated and considered. Of course, soft tissue damage. If we have a very bad soft tissue, it's a very bad idea to do a reconstruction of the capsule and the labrum because probably it's no good anymore. And of course, uh, we need to be precise and to have a good indication for all the procedures we have. My algorithm is 2020, but I showed this slide first time at the San Diego shoulder course when Jim Ash invited me at that time, so 15 years ago. I was showing this, almost nobody at that time was agreeing with me. Now it looks like most people is agreeing with this. So if I have an ISIS score, at that time ISIS score was not existing, but I, at that, that time I was just pointing the uh, attention to the bone defect. But now ISIS score is less than three, and if you have less than three, probably you don't have any bone defect. Bunker repair is perfect. If we have a, a less than three with a heel sacs, which is not very common, I think you can do bunker repair and replissage. I think it's a good technique. But if we have bone defects higher than 10, I don't think it's a good idea to do a bank cart or soft tissue only, even adding a, a, a remplissage. I do a bony procedure. And for me, the difference between Latarge and other techniques, other technique and bone block, which is the technique I developed many years ago, are the chron if it's chronic or not chronic. I decided many years ago that uh, if uh, the history started more than three years before, I was doing something else, the bone block. And doing like this, uh, most people ask me how you can decide if you have good quality or bad quality. Following this, I always had the impression arthroscopically the, 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 the ligaments and the labrum were good quality. I did bone block and I did it right because in this patient, I had exactly the same recurrence rate than Latarge. 
but this is an anatomical procedure, is uh, safer, is more reproducible than any way you're gonna do Latage. Anyway, I knew that I need to do Latage, another technique, and I'll show you later uh, on the way I'm gonna do that. And I totally agree. I was uh, supporting this, publishing this first uh, with my uh, mini open arthroscopically assisted Latage. I published that in 2013. And now with Castricini, all arthroscopic, that buttons are definitely safer and easier to reproduce than screws for doing the Latage. And so, the Triton algorithm, now we know that we have all these procedures that we can use for fixing an unstable shoulder. So soft tissue is still good in a class of patients. And also patients with bony defects, but they are acute bony banker, they can be repaired arthroscopically. Of course, remplissage can find a place in this group of patients too. And of course, remplissage can be also added to bone block or latage because especially if you do this arthroscopic, it's very simple and you can do it. Just, I don't do remplissage if the uh, heel sax is, re is uh, ranging from lateral to medial. When it's too medial, I think it's a bad idea. When it's lateral, I think it's a good idea. This area is actually two thirds of my patient. So it's not that a, it's a, a niche procedure. This is my main procedure because this is for people where uh, a soft tissue repair is an under treatment and Latage would be an over treatment. And so when I can do the same, when I can achieve the same result than this, in this group, I do this because this is more anatomical. I don't cut any bridge. If a Latage fails, it's not common. If it fails, it would be a real problem. And so I totally disagree with the French, especially with Ballot, saying that if we have a latage and if it fails, you do this. He's saying he's doing the Eden Hibinet, which is not exactly, but it's basically this, this technique. I think it's better to do this. And if this fail, you do latage. And of course, remaining in non-anatomical procedure, now we have also other possibilities. So doing bone block with uh, arthroscopic scapular augmentation looks like uh, promising instead of doing Latage, that in my opinion is uh, the last procedure we should do in patient with a stable shoulder, because after this, uh, it fades, it's very complicated, and the complication with the Latage can be very serious. So even if the number cannot be, can be reduced because uh, you learn how to do it, if you have a neurological problem and it's not that uncommon with this procedure, definitely less uncommon with Latage than all the others, this, guy will remember you for all his life because he's doing bad. So from our biomechanical and uh, diagnostic examination comes the key for the success. If we select properly the patient, we have a, a good chance to have be successful at the first time. And whenever it's possible, my preference is anatomical procedure. So banker, but if we have bony erosion, bone block. If not indicated in chronic cases, I do arthroscopically assist the Latage, that in my opinion is still the most uh, easy way to do the Latage in a precise fa fashion or ar arthroscopic. Of course, promise for future is also the uh, subscap uh, augmentation that can be another uh, arrow to our, uh, to, to our surgical uh, pos possibilities. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Dr. Taverna. That was a wonderful talk on... Thank you, Dr. Taverna. That was a wonderful talk on uh, in, uh, bone assessment. Is there any question to Dr. Taverna on this? Anybody has any question regarding the assessment of yeah. bone loss and instability? Yeah, Dr. Taverna. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You are doing bone block procedure for uh, all your uh, cases, right? Initial, primary cases. No, I'm doing bone block in my patient with uh, bone defects uh, higher than 10% if we have a bipolar uh, bone defects, meaning glenoid and uh, humeral head. 15% if we have a erosion only on the glenoid and uh, with uh, a history of dislocation that is no more than three, maybe four years. 
Uh, so these are, you know, the my indication for bone block that in all unstable shoulder I'm treating per year is about two thirds of my patient. A third of my patient, I mean, uh, uh, the rest, which is uh, 10%, 15% are pure bankers of tissue. And on the other side, lethargy. You have done both bank um, uh, lethargy as well as bone block. Do you find any difference like uh, you are not having sling effect or osteolysis is more in uh, bone block procedures? Uh, regarding bone block, uh, the um, osteolysis and the bone integration depends a lot on which graft you, you choose because many other grafts, they have a very bad uh, bone integration uh, rate. Older grafts, they have excellent. So in conclusion, I found in many years, because it's about uh, 15 years now that I'm doing bone block. I'm I've used iliac crest autograft, which is good, but of course, uh, not many patients like that because uh, they have uh, the donor side that can be painful. Uh, if I have to choose a holograft, uh, there is a, a, a specific one I'm choosing, which is the LifeNet, which is the one that in my hands uh, had the best bone integration. Uh, anyway, among the three, holograft, uh, autograft, xenograft is the worst. And unfortunately, is also the most expensive. That's why I practically uh, left allograft. In the recent years, I'm using equine bone that actually is the best. So uh, regarding bone block, depends uh, which kind of graft you choose. Regarding uh, latarge, I think uh, uh, you know improving the techniques, being more precise with bony tunnels. Uh, and uh, the face of the, uh, the coracoid, you reduces a lot uh, the um, uh, absorption of the upper part of the glenoid. But it's true that, uh, uh, especially for Latage, this is something that can happen. And this is one more reason for not using the screws anymore. Because if you uh, use screws, the uh, higher screw, the upper screw, most of the time would be in the empty because uh, after one year, two years, the upper part of the glenoid would be resolved. Otherwise, if you use buttons, there is not this problem. Yeah, there are a couple of questions from the from the delegates here, Dr. Taverna. What is the difference between an arthroscopic assisted latage? Is it different from arthrolatage? It is, and if you don't mind, I have another talk, and I will show the two techniques, so you you can see. Okay. Another anyway, uh, if I can, if I can uh, tell you something, I don't want to be unkind. It's just that uh, the arthroscopically assisted latage, in my opinion is the latage that uh, reduces, minimize the risk of latage and improves at the best uh, the precision. Because we do an orthoscopic part when we introduce the guide I developed for a uh, bone block. So creating double tunnels, bony tunnels in the glenoid. And we have demonstrated and published that in this way, you can be very precise, much more precise than any other method, even open because uh, there, is, there is a study of uh, the group of Gerber and Meyer showing that with uh, an anterior uh, guide for open latange, you, uh, you, would, you would have a posterior tilt of the, the angle between the tunnels and the face of the glenoid, and is the best published to date, that is 4.5. Otherwise, we publish in the Journal of um, Shoulder Surgery, the, the British uh, publication, that doing the the the, 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 the bony tunnels with uh, my bone block guide, this angle is 1.5, meaning that it's really parallel to the glenoid face. And you cannot be as precise as this if you use any kind of an anterior approach. So I understood long ago that for being precise for doing the bony tunnel, you, you bony tunnels, you should have a posterior approach, and you can have that very easily arthroscopically. Very easily, arthroscopically, you can uh, detach the labrum and prepare uh, the face of the glenoid. You're much more accurate doing that arthroscopically than open. Then, if you go on doing that, everything um, arthroscopic, first of all, harvesting the coracoid uh, could be a little dangerous, but you can manage how to do it. But there is one step that you are no precise as doing uh, that open which is preparing the face of the coracoid that should face the glenoid, the glenoid neck. And so it's very important that the two areas, they are very flat with the cancellous bone. 
Of course, you know, if you do that arthroscopic, you can use a burr, you can use a saw, you can use a rasp, but it's never precise. And so when I do the arthroscopic preparation of uh, the joint, then I open, I just do a mini open, I just enlarge a uh, couple of centimeters my myglenoid portals. I harvest the coracoid. I prepare very nicely with a preparation tool that I will show you that uh, allow you to prepare the coracoid in the, in the way that arthroscopic to date is impossible. And then using the buttons, you just close it. So in that way, it's very simple. Uh, the steps of the arthroscopic uh, latage are exactly the same. Uh, as I said with Castricini, I developed this technique uh, combining bone block and latage. You can do that. I still think uh, uh, you, uh, this is a, a technique uh, I'm showing. Uh, I think uh, it's useful to know how to do it. But to date, I think uh, if you're going to do a user arthroscopically assisted, you are more precise and less risky than doing all arthroscopic or purely open lethargy. I think uh, we should move on to the next talk because I think... Yes, Dr. Antau, yes, Dr. Antau, yes. Yes. Dr. Ettore. Hi. Hi, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Do you have a clinical study where you compare the number of dislocations to the uh, defect, uh, glenoid or bipolar, because you say in three episodes of dislocation, you get so much of defect in the head of the humerus vis-a-vis -vis the glenoid. In our setup, we don't see this. Is it the articular surface different in the European group compared to the Indian group? Uh, no, actually, um... I don't have uh, personally any publication of that, although there are, you can find in the literature some publication showing that. But this was um, uh, my arbitrary choice many years ago to decide when to do bone block instead of latrage. And it uh, was not because of the bone defects that can be variable, because uh, if you have three or five episodes uh, or even seven episodes, especially if it's a, 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 a recurrence that is not starting more than three, four years ago, uh, you can still have uh, good, good uh, quality soft tissue. So these numbers for me are focused on the quality of the soft tissue more than the bone. So uh, now I'm not so restrictive uh, to date in my clinical practice if they have uh, five episodes, but even 10 can be uh, feasible and uh, eligible for bone block if they started to have this location no more than three, four years uh, before. So for me, the most important data is the first episode of dislocation. If this guy had a first dislocation 10 years before to come to my office, I know that bone block, at least the classical one with the capsule and uh, labrum reconstruction is not indicated. Maybe bone block having the subscap augmentation could be indicated, but today for me, those patients are eligible only for Latage uh, procedure. I think, uh, I think we should move on to the next lecture. I'll request Chirag. Chirag, can you hear me? Uh, you can start the program uh, call for a third lecture. Francesco, can you share your screen? Dr. Francesco? Uh, I'll just mute everyone, Francesco. Yeah, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So next up is about uh, humeral bone defect and these three kind of treatment uh, in uh, that we can uh, use for this kind of punto, uh, this kind of problem. Just a moment. It doesn't. Just, okay. Why a sex lesion is a trouble and when heel sex lesion is a trouble and which is the best treatment that we can uh, perform for this kind of problem. The first question is uh, why is it trouble? We have talked uh, a lot about this problem and so we can go on about this uh, paper published in 2000 that described the importance of physical bone defect, not only at, but at the glenoid level, but uh, the humeral, si humeral side. And uh, so we, we have uh, an, a critical bone defect at uh, the, the humeral site. When is uh, 
um, a trouble when we have a significant bone defect, uh, as you know, when we have uh, an engaging ill sex, we have in the retroaction some uh, percentage that describe, it, describe the critical bone defect. But the thing that uh, the most important is uh, the, the description of, uh, a, of the engaging ill sex. You know, everybody what means engaging ill sex. After that, as I showed you before, E.G. explained the, his theory about the Illinois truck. And uh, going on, because I don't want to bother, we arrive to address this kind of problem, and which is the ideal treatment for uh, human outside. At first, we need to fill the defect, as it was uh, demonstrated by the vitreation and, and, uh, and by our recent uh, experience. We have some te techniques that we can uh, realize. The first one is the repissage, of course. Of course, the second is osarticular allograft, and the third one oats. The repissage is uh, a very famous technique, very popular now because uh, it's very easy to to achieve uh, to perform. It was published in 2004 by Wolf. This is our paper that demonstrated that uh, we won't have uh, any big, any important problem, any significant problem of uh, loss of external rotation, and uh, and uh, and a very success. And, and we demonstrated that it was a very success successful procedure about uh, reducing the recurrence rate. How is uh, it, it is uh, um, performed? is a very easy step-by-step -step technique. If you follow step-by-step -step this technique, you will, uh, you will go to success, of course. I use the standard portal to perform this uh, technique. You don't have to perform a special kind of portal, as you can see here. Uh, and when you have to de detect it, you're off track or on track that you want to, uh, to, 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 de to deal inside the, the shoulder, you had to, at first, uh, you had to prepare a bone, a very good bone bleeding surface in order to let the soft tissue attach to the lesion. Sometimes we have used micro fracture, as you can see here. This is the final effect. You have to insert the first anchor or uh, only one anchor. And uh, my secret or my uh, favorite procedure is to insert inside the subacromial space, not through the capsule, another cannula that I call blind cannula because uh, you are not able to see through the capsule, of course, because uh, it remains inside uh, the subacromial space. And you can see here the suture that you retrieved with the suture retriever parked inside this cannula. Through this camera, you use uh, some suture retriever to, to, to pass the posterior capsule and to retrieve the suture through the posterior capsule. Of course, you have to tie the knot of the bunker repair at first, and only at the end of the procedure, you have to tie the knot of uh, your reemplissage repair. And you can observe the tying the knot inside the subacromial super space. And this aim is very useful to use the blind camera because uh, it's not possible in this case, tangling of the suture. But otherwise you can go, you can do it blindly in a blind way. Which are the concerns of the reemplissage technique? Of course, it's not a, an anatomic technique because you sacrifice part of the posterior capsule, as you, as you know. And which are the other concerns? The rows of external rotation, the fair, which sport uh, is, uh, is not uh, possible to afford with this kind of technique. These are a very recent uh, publication is a review that shows uh, that uh, these uh, authors shows uh, that they have no deficit about uh, 
external annotations. Many other authors like me found no non-significant deficit. The principles are the same that I showed you before because the, the most important thing is uh, to compare the non-affected sites to the affected sites. Ali Rashid uh, showed the doubtful ref results about the laws of external rotation. What about our circular allograft? I tried to start with this experience uh, about four years ago, but now I abandoned with for uh, uh, problems at the, um, of pain at, don at the donor sites. At first, I tried to harvest um, some bones from uh, from the iliac crest, as you can see here, for with a tube harvester, homemade, of course, and I filled the defect with these uh, um, candles of a bone inside the hill sacs. Especially if you have a medial hill sacs, you will have successful to perform this kind of procedure. This is the harvesting of the bone at the level of the Ilia crest. After that, you have to perform a reaming one millimeter less of the sides of the of the bone that you have to insert inside the defect. And after that, we with again in procedure, we tap the bone inside the yield sacs defect. So as I have left this uh, kind of procedure for the north side the problem, uh, also because uh, I started with the uh, OATS experience, uh, averaging the holograft from a uh, uh, donor, a donor, of course. As you can see here, the procedure is the same of the OATS uh, that is made in, uh, in the knee, for example. I harvest, uh, after having harvested the, the bone, I perform the donor, the donor side with one millimeter less uh, in size. And after that, I tap the bone inside the, the tunnel. And this is one of the, of the, um, of the results. As you, as you can see here, the, um, the candle, the oats is uh, proud. And I left this kind of, uh, uh, tra transplant, transplant uh, um, proud. Why? Because you have uh, to feel the defect, not at the level of the lesions, but you have to um, increase uh, the level of the surface of the humeral side when you have, uh, for example, a medial humeral defect. And uh, since I didn't have uh, any problem of uh, um, impingement inside the joint. This is the uh, CT scan check. This is our population that we have studied. We have made a formula to understand how many um, hoats we have to realize to cover all the defect. Of course, the best place to place to perform your OATS is the medial side, because as explained by Ettore Taverna, this is the most dangerous place when, where you can have uh, uh, Neil Sachs lesions. Last chance, of course, when you have to deal with a, de with a huge defect, more than 40% is uh, allograft shells al like in this case, but you had to open the shoulder and to perform a procedure very invasive. This is the check. So in conclusion, we need to fill the defect. We have different procedure, like the first one is the reemplissage that is very easy to perform. In case of uh, less than 30% of the involvement of the humeral surface, we can use a articular allograft and, and oats. And of course, if you have uh, more than 30%, we can uh, have to use osteochondral alloshep graft. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Franceschi, for that wonderful talk and insight on uh, uh, the oats for the humoral uh, defect on the hill sacks. Any question to Dr. Franceschi? Yeah. Where did you harvest the graft from, Dr. Franceschi, in oats? Um, the most of the time, I used to perform with aloe graft. With, you understand? Aloe graft. If you do not have an access to an aloe graft, what would you prefer? I started my experience with the iliac crest, you know, because I don't want to to hit another joint. Of course, I don't. I don't very. I don't. I don't want to to harvest the oats from the knee, for example. It, uh, it would be the most natural side to harvest from the iliac crest. Maybe you don't uh, have to damage any joint. I think iliac crest may not give you the uh, the right bone because here we are going to build the cartilage area of uh, hill sac, the humeral head. The best will be the osteochondral allograft we are, because we have done few iliac crest, free iliac crest bone grafting for the hill sacs. It never gives you the same result. So mm -hmm. I think the osteochondral allograft is the best answer, which is currently not available in India. Chirac. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, any other question apart from Chirag? On, uh, Dr. Kevin wants to ask something. He needs to unmute himself. Who? Dr. Kevin wants to ask. He needs to unmute himself. Okay. Samir, you have question, Samir? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yes. uh, Francisco, uh, you are used uh, allograft as well as you are done remplissage. What is your uh, preference to do? Whether you are more, uh, more happy with oats or a remplissage procedure? Unfortunately, unfortunately, it was uh, really impossible to compare the two techniques because uh, uh, um, it's very uh, expensive in Italy, allograft. And so it's uh, impossible to extend this kind of procedure to all the population. So it was uh, a beginning experience and a very, experimental experience and I really anyway satisfied quite satisfied about the two techniques the same. I didn't have any problem with allograft or with uh, uh, with allograft or its technique. I, I have a couple of questions to Francesco. Can I yes. ask? Yes, yes, please go okay. ahead. <laughs> okay, Francesco, I thought that was a very nice presentation. I liked it. I have a first one question. What was the diameter of uh, your OATS? This is the first. And the second that uh, a little bit you showed, it's very hard otoscopically, but even open uh, with the humeral head, which is uh, a convex area to be uh, in this coaxial in two planes in order not to have one side of the OATS that is really <coughs> into the hole and one part that is uh, proud. Uh, so, you, do you have any trick for that? Because, uh, you know, if it's really oblique uh, compared to the face uh, and the area of the human head, it's not effective. Uh, you are really right. The first uh, answer is that I showed uh, a formula that we realized to understand how many watts we have to do to cover all the, the surface of the heel sacs. I have to say that uh, even if uh, we calculated before the operation that we needed uh, three watts to cover the, the, you know, the um, overall surface, we perform at, at the maximum um, two, two watts, not more at first. And the second, second answer is uh, that I showed, I showed you the best, one of the best results, of course, that I have had, sincerely. And uh, uh, the, um, the thing that uh, you have asked me, sincerely, is uh, one of the problems. But I have to say that uh, in the worst cases of non-congruent surface, I didn't have any problem of uh, clicking, of uh, locking. And so I was never really very uh, worried about that. Sincerely, okay. uh, I started with this, with this experience because uh, I made a lot of cases in the knee. And also in the knee, sometimes it's very difficult to match the two surfaces, no? And uh, also in the knee, I never had uh, so much problem. 
Okay, I think uh, we should move on to the next talk. Uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Chirak to start the proceeding. Chirak, can you hear me? I'll request Dr. Taverna to share his screen. Okay. Uh, can you see my, my talk? Yes, yes. We can see you. I'll just mute everyone. Good. Yeah, yeah you can go ahead. Okay. So uh, now how to manage unstable shoulder with glenoid bone loss. Uh, my algorithm and techniques for that. Uh, I already, these are my disclosure for this talk. I already talked in the first uh, lecture uh, diagnostic algorithm, I think it's good to, to see that again, because I really think that this is the, uh, the base where to start for being successful in treating the patient. So look for bone defects, calculate the worries, and then to decide. I also think, uh, you know, it's important to know that we, if we have a bone defect in a patient, all the, with no really much request of uh, uh, of uh, function of the shoulder, maybe in conjunction with a rotator cuff, probably, you know, uh, bone defects in a patient of 70 years old is not so important. And this is the treatment algorithm I showed you before, and this is my guide for all my patients. So I'm starting showing, showing you a couple of cases. So this is a 36 year old man uh, practicing ski, jogging, windsurfing, right hand dominant shoulder. So total four uh, non-traumatic radius location after the first uh, that was uh, less than one year, I mean, two years before he came to my office. So this is the summary of uh, his uh, uh, imaging. So bony bunker, a little dislocated. So what would you do? We, I think, you know, hearing and looking at the literature, there are many options. Uh, and uh, from banker repair to Latage or Edenibinet bone block. And I think cases like this are really feasible to do arthroscopic repair with suture anchor of uh, the bony banker. If uh, the bony banker is uh, quite acute or subacute, the piece of bone is still alive, you can reduce it, you can repair it. And most of these patients, they go well. So with a technique that is very similar to our, our techniques, arthroscopic techniques. So another case, this is a glenite fracture. He's 29 years old man uh, playing soccer and ski. Uh, first traumatic anterior dislocation 2019 and then two non-traumatic dislocation a few days later. Look at the CT scan. So this is not a bony banker. This is really a glenite fracture. And uh, until a few years ago, the option were maybe to fix that with a screw, but uh, it's really hard and it's really dangerous technique. And so these were uh, the possibility and many authors, they still uh, say that conservative treatment can be feasible for this patient. I don't think so. This guy had uh, two redislocation after a few days. And so really uh, this, uh, the, the choice with, was between a screw fixation. Oh, now that we have uh, other possibilities, other possibilities is this is what I'm doing in this patient. Since I have the buttons, I found that this is an excellent way to repair lanyard fracture in a very safe and precise way. So we enter with the scope, we see the fracture is quite uh, acute, so it's not difficult to reduce it. And uh, with the instrumentation I developed for bone block, especially the guide is very useful. So it's useful also the technique to enter with a, a spinal needle being in order to be parallel, to grab with the hook of uh, the guide, the, the fracture to reduce it, then to drill one or two holes, here depends on the size of the fracture, and then not try to detach the labrum and the capsule is not that difficult to find the hole through the capsule and through the bone. And then just to use the buttons to reduce it and compress it a little bit. And uh, I did uh, several cases I did. I also published this um, for a series of 10 cases. But what is amazing, look at this. Look at how good is the reduction of the fracture. It's super precise. It's a very simple and fast procedure thanks to the buttons. So the round and the buttons are really good also for a patient like this with the glenite fractures. And so this is the third case. 
is a bipolar bond affair, 24 years old man playing soccer, first dislocation 2017, and then two traumatic re-dislocation. So this is the evaluation, heel sacks, bond affair, 18%, what to do? I think uh, many French that would do La Tauge and uh, some other people, maybe some part of the world just uh, bunker repair and uh, remplissage. No, my chance for this patient is different. I show you this because I show you this video that uh, I showed in San Diego 2005. I understood at that time for being precise, and precise during the tunnel that you should do from posterior to anterior. Of course, at the time was a prodromic uh, technique. I was using an ACL guide. I remember perfectly Pascal Boileau in the audience looking at this. And then at that time, I didn't have the buttons, but I was able to use an uh, autograph, Tilia Crest, and I was very flush. But then fixing from anterior with screws, most of my CT scan were like this. This guy went very well, but I was not satisfied about the direction of my screws. And if you look at the more recent way to do arthroscopic uh, latarge from uh, the, 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 the technique ideated by Lafosse, in many, many of these uh, CT scan, you see the, the, the screws position is basically the same. It's not very different. Since uh, 2013, I was able to use the round and the buttons. And so look at the bone block procedure, which is the choice for this patient. Uh, is like uh, any other shoulder arthroscopy. So you have just two portals in the rotator interval, posterior portal for the scope and for the guide. In this guy, I was still using the allograft. Now, as I said, I'm using the xenograft, the fine bone. We can talk about this later if you want. The dimension of the, uh, this graft were one, one centimeter by one by two. So this uh, the average uh, dimension of the, of the glenoid. That's why I, I chose this, uh, this dimension that would cover bone defects higher than 35% of the glenoid. So any kind of defect. We introduced through the rotator interval a uh, cannula 15 millimeters diameter. We pass from posterior to anterior shuttle suture, the same way I was showing in San Diego 2005. Just that now I have a more uh, instrumentation dedicated for this, especially the guy now is doing for that. And using two couples of round and the button is so much simpler than one, because if you have two, uh, you can just pull and release the, 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 the traction suture. I'm holding the scope and holding uh, the loop suture grabber, and my assistant is pulling and releasing. I'm just saying pull, release, pull, release, and almost automatically the graft goes in the exact position where it should be, very uh, exactly centered in the, in, in the center of the bone defect, and uh, very flush with the, with the glenoid bony ring, so not the glenoid ring. And then when you do this, on top of that, you do your bunker repair. So in my opinion, this is the real bunker plus. So it's a bunker repair and restoring the bone defect in patient with uh, uh, you know, uh, soft tissue detachment and bony defects. They don't need a lot of they, It's sufficient to do this because following my indication, I did more than 100, 150 cases. Uh, I, I don't consider the cases I did before 2000. Uh, 13 with the screws, uh, that they have actually the similar results. And uh, uh, these were, you know, the good, the good result. The recurrence rate of this patient is less than 2%. So absolutely similar than the most of papers re reporting for Latoge. And in France and in many other countries in this patient, they, they would do a Latoge, but Latoge is can be a very difficult procedure, challenging and risky. This is not risky because uh, you've seen, I'm just working through the rotator interval with classical arthroscopic portals. The radiological results were almost perfect in placing the graft, the position, and in terms of resorption, of course, in this uh, series, I was using allograft and uh, LifeNet and uh, uh, more recently, Xenograft. And uh, the resolution ranges between 20 to 57, uh, the worst cases. And even if you have more than half of this uh, graft uh, resolved, if you think that uh, um, three millimeters of uh, uh, the fat of uh, the glenoid I showed you before is uh, about 20% uh, of bone defects, 
and the width of my graft is one centimeter, even if you have a five millimeter resorption, you still plenty cover the bone defects of the patients. And not using the screws, you don't have any more the, the head of the screws proud in the, in the joint. In fact, mobility, range of motion is very good, almost no restriction of any motion and almost no complication because this is a simple reproducible technique, not risky with difficult portals. And the, so in summarizing, I would say the bone block versus soft tissue, there is a lower occurrence rate, especially long-term results. It's very good. This was published by me. And this is an anatomical reconstruction of bone and soft tissue in patients with unstable shoulder, with bone defects and soft tissue problems. Compared to bristol latter classical, bone block is anatomical. Uh, this is non-anatomical. There is no tendinous transfer because it's not needed. If you have a good capsule and good uh, labrum, there is no need for conjoint tendon action. So no subscap split. And the perfect position of the bony tunnels, thanks to the guide, avoid the so wrong position of the screws that create most of the problem in the classical open lateral jet or uh, even arthroscopic news and screws. As I said, since I'm using Zengraft equine bone, also the bony resorption is uh, definitely uh, minimal. And also the good thing about this uh, graft is that uh, it's pre-modeled for this technique. So it comes already in the shape you want. You have just to open the, the, the holes are pre-drilled and you just use that. And it's cheap. It's not like holograft, which is very expensive. It's cheap instead of thousands of dollars per piece. With talking about hundreds of dollars for this. And this makes a difference also in countries like Italy where the reimbursement is very low. The weak point of this technique and when you have a bad quality of soft tissue, how I can decide, I told you, I just uh, select the patient before. If it's chronic cases, I postulate that they, they, they have a bad uh, quality tissue. If they are three years, four years, most of the time, actually all the time in my uh, series, they had the good quality uh, ligaments. In these patients, you need the action of the conjoint tendon. Of course, the key for success for a good latage is uh, placing the coracoid in a proper position, placing the bony tunnels in uh, parallel to the glenoid. And also if you use screws, it's important the length of the screw. And as I was telling you, the best published data regarding the position and the angle of the screw is this uh, of uh, Dominic Meyer and Gerber group that was uh, uh, 4.5. If uh, uh, you look at the uh, other authors in Italy, but also La Fosse and others, they have more than 20, 25, 30 degrees of uh, inclination. And uh, if you have uh, this, the, this position of the screw, really osteoarthritic and other problems can be uh, an issue after a few years. So what to do? Uh, actually, now we have uh, latarge plural, because we have a different option for doing this procedure. We have open with one screw, open with two screws, the arthroscopically assisted with two screws, that was the very beginning, uh, the way I was doing that. Arthroscopically assisted with two couples of round and the buttons, arthroscopic with one couple of round of and the round and the buttons, two couples of round and the buttons, or other um, variation like the Valenti technique that is using different uh, fixation system. Uh, as I said, I was using the guide for my arthroscopically assisted. At the beginning, I was using Kirchner Y as a guidance and cannulated screw. And this was the angle, the mean angle. And we published this and we understood that using the guide, we were able to place two tunnel perfectly parallel between the self and perfectly perpendicular to the anterior glenoid neck. And this is the key for having good bony uh, integration, even if you use a screw. But uh, since uh, I'm not using screws anymore, this is the, my actual technique. So preparation of the glenoid in the same fashion I'm doing uh, my bone block. And this is another thing that makes me calm when I start to this kind of procedure. I know now that even if I decide to do a bone block, I can change intraoperatively to a latage, just uh, completing all arthroscopic or uh, just uh, the way you see now, arthroscopically assisted. Arthroscopically assisted, we use the same guide for the bone block, 
So in this way, we are very precise with the bony tunnel. We can control that parallel between the self and especially that perpendicular to the Glen Eye. And this is the guide of the bone block. Uh, and this is very good and very simple. Maybe you can prepare the holes for your suture anchor if you want to reconstruct the capsule. And then you just enlarge a little bit your uh, inferior, um, I'm sorry, there is the volume. Anyway, in this way, you see how precise you can be in preparing the coracoid, diminishing the risk of the harvesting the coracoid. And uh, these uh, instruments would give you the possibility to do the tunnels in the coracoid exactly at the same distance uh, of uh, the tunnels in the glenoid. And then what you do arthroscopic, you can do open, you just pass the shuttle suture to the uh, to the to, from posterior to anterior. You pass uh, the shuttle suture in the coracoid. You load the buttons and you reduce and you place the coracoid in the position you do uh, with the, with the bone block. Just uh, you follow that no more with the scope. You follow that with your eyes and with your fingers, and you realize after compressing it how good is the fixation with the, with, the, with, the, with the buttons because you cannot move your coracoid anymore after you have tensioned your double couple or round in the buttons. Instead of a boileau technique, this technique has two pair of uh, round in the buttons so you might have a much better rotational stability since the beginning. I think is important because uh, you don't have to wait bone integration for having a, a good stability of the coracoid and the conjoint tendon in the proper position. And uh, fixing this only with the, with the knot is not enough for have a good stability. And if you do this uh, combined open and orthoscopic technique, you realize that immediately because if you try to twist with your fingers the coracoid after you've done this uh, uh, knot, you can do it. Otherwise, if you use uh, the tensioner I'm seeing, I'm showing you, then you tension and you arrive at one point when it is impossible to rotate anymore, even one millimeter the glenoid. And you check that with your fingers. And this is very simple, very effective. And uh, you diminish the risk of the lateralization. My experience with this is uh, several cases. Probably now we are more than 100 cases we did in the, in the recent years. And uh, Recurrence rate is a little higher than bone block because uh, it's a different population. This patient were more chronic with more instability. And so that explains why I have a little uh, higher recurrence rate compared to the bone block. But my ability to place the coracoid, sorry, and go back, um, to place the coracoid in the proper position. And you see how good is the bone integration in the coracoid is much better than what I was obtaining with my open lateral with the screw. And I think this thanks to the technique because I prepared nicely the face of the coracoid, the face of the, of the glenoid, and I'm very precise with the tunnels. And this is thanks to the technique, I would say, to the instrumentation. In fact, uh, we have, uh, uh, good good results and we have really no uh, bad uh, complication because I think this technique is really, in my opinion, or at least in my hands, the safer and more reproducible. So we don't have all the best, com the bad complication published in literature of people trying to do arthroscopic latarge. Although uh, talking with uh, my colleagues in Italy, especially Roberto Castricini, we developed together the technique for doing also this technique, uh, all arthroscopic, um, which is fine. And I think it's uh, simpler than using only one couple of round in the bottom, because if you have two couples, you can manage better the entrance of the coracoid and the conjoint tendon through the, through the hole. So this is the technique. Uh, Castricini is an Italian doctor that uh, did many, many, num huge numbers of Latage with the La Fosse technique. He came to visit me. And we thought together that we could combine uh, bone, bone block technique, meaning using this guide and latage with a two couple of round and the buttons. And also I didn't want to use portals uh, uh, medial to the coracoid. So we don't have uh, this, uh, from, in my opinion, dangerous portals. And I didn't want to use the spreaders. 
and if you just split the soups cap and you have two couple of round and the buttons, it's simpler to pass the coracoid. Then we have also developed a guide for the coracoid. Actually, we have two guides. This that is very similar to the one of the bone block for the glenoid. But since the coracoid, sometimes they have a curved or hooked, or hooked uh, uh, conformation, we have also have developed a, a simpler uh, guide, if you want, I can show you another video later, uh, that uh, can, uh, can fit any kind of coracoid. Anyway, also this guide, as the uh, meaning to have uh, the two holes uh, the, with the, uh, the same offset uh, that we have in the glenoid uh, neck, so they're gonna face perfectly. And instead of having one hole, they have two holes. Uh, at this point, we pass the shuttle suture through the subscap pleat uh, coming from uh, the glenoid and they pass uh, through, the, through the coracoid. And when you have done this, you just need to cut a little bit of uh, the, the coracoid after, of course, you have released all the soft tissue, the pec minor and the other, uh, the other soft tissue around the coracoid. And uh, you can control it quite, you see the subscap split and you see that, uh, you know, in this fashion, we don't need to use uh, so many instrumentation and spreader because with two couples of round and the button, just pulling and releasing the way I've showed you for the bone block, is simpler to use uh, the, the graft. So while well, I say, oh, I'm using one because it's simpler, I don't know. <laughs> Everybody can, can have uh, his opinion and his choice, but uh, if you have only one couple and you pull the coracoid inside, the coracoid starts to rotate in all direction and twisting the, the suture. Otherwise, if you have two, just pulling and releasing, passes almost automatically through the, through the split and goes uh, almost automatically in the right position. Although I think that this technique uh, that, uh, in my opinion, is an improvement for uh, uh, the Latage still has the weak point that the preparation of the face of the coracoid is no good uh, like, uh, the, the way we can, like, like the way we can do open. We did uh, some cases of that. And last thing is something that uh, I developed otherwise with uh, two other Italian surgeons, uh, Professor Russo and um, Dr. Mayotte and Professor Mayotti. And uh, they wanted to do my bone block technique. Uh, that actually, this is the first case uh, we did with uh, Dr. Mayotti in Rome. I went down to help him. And uh, as you can see, he's, he's uh, keeping the patient in a lateral position. So this is a technique, the bone block, that you can do without any problem in lateral and beach chair. Otherwise, uh, for lateral chair, I would recommend to use beach chair, chair all the time. And uh, this technique, uh, uh, they, we wanted to add uh, the subscapularis uh, augmentation, meaning the, subs the, the tenodesis, the upper part of the subscapularis. I went down to help him. Technically, I was very skeptical regarding this because uh, uh, like everybody in, in the past, we thought that uh, placing the subscap in this position would restrict highly the external rotation. And then looking at his cases and uh, Russo cases that they have a follow-up of uh, almost 10 years now, really there is no restriction of external rotation. The explanation is that this is, of course, is not a putty plat, it's very different. Uh, and uh, after a little bit, uh, uh, after you start the rehabilitation, the, probably uh, this part of the subscalp start to detach and form a scar tissue like a neoligaments. Anyway, uh, I did some cases myself too. I'm following these cases. I cannot recommend to date uh, that this is technique uh, that uh, can be instead of uh, latage for chronic cases, but looks promising. And, and uh, if uh, I would achieve the same results with this technique instead of latage, I think it's still less complicated and uh, uh, it does don't cut any bridge for future. And I have also a good number of these. So conclusion, bone defects higher 10%, bony procedure. One is possible, I'm doing um, uh, anatomical procedure. When it's not possible, latage in different ways or uh, arthroscopic subscapular augmentation combined with the bone block is still a, a good option. Whenever it's possible, as I said, I prefer bone block because it's safe and it's definitely safer than latage is reproducible, it's not a difficult technique because uh, once you have placed your guide, the rest is guided. And one thing that Smith and Nephew, which I developed the technique with them, told me is that uh, people coming to visiting me for 
doing the bone block, they have a high percent of surgeons that they can do that at home. People visiting Boileau for doing the Latagé, they have a very low uh, percent of people able to reproduce because, of course, it's more challenging to do a Latagé than a bone block. And is it effective in the same way with a good indication? Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Taverna. It was a wonderful talk. Is there any question to Dr. Taverna? Yeah. On bony procedures, yes. Yeah, Taverna, Dr. Taverna, excellent technique what you showed. But my concern is you are using uh, two endobuttons anteriorly, two endobuttons posteriorly. Right? And your uh, graft is fixed only on the threads, what you say the uh, suture material is there. How it is better than the screws for the bending forces, where the bending forces in the screws are many, 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 many times higher what we get than the screws, it's, uh, than the just suture material itself. Uh, of yeah, course. Of, course, of course, if you do a uh, biomechanical study on rotational stability and shear forces, uh, screws are better than um, are better than buttons. It's true, uh, but uh, we have uh, now quite long history to show that buttons are good enough to allow the, the bone to integrate and to uh, be fi being fixed. Actually, for this, buttons are better than screws. The CT scan I have with the buttons, I have much better bone integration than screws. Explanation could be because uh, you do smaller tunnel tunnels in the in the coracoid, which is not or the or the graft. You still have uh, bone marrow flowing all the time from the glenoids to the to the to the block or to the coracoid, and this helps a lot to have a bone integration. So rotational stability is good enough uh, in the first months, especially with two couples of uh, round and the bottom for having a good stability of the construct, meaning bone graft or, or coracoid. And then bone integration, thanks to this, uh, is better than using screws. And tying and the knot. Even if it, and the last thing, also very important, even if you have some resorption, you would have there are only two buttons and you do this, you see the CT scan, the bottom would lie all the time against the bone. If you have resorption, you're gonna have uh, the screw in the empty, very dangerous. And without tensioning, have you seen the cases uh, fail? Oh, uh, I never did without tensioning. When the tensioner was not available, I didn't do that at the very beginning. So I started, uh, actually uh, the, the buttons for me, uh, were available uh, at the end of 2012, but since the tensioner was not available, I waited until uh, January 2013. I think the cases uh, Pascal did before the tensioner, they had the worst results in terms of... Uh, Dr. Taverna, I have, a, I have a question related to your technique. In fact, uh, we saw this technique when you are in Mumbai. It was a fantastic way to know you developed the technique. But uh, the only thing is, in Latarje, the effect is mainly because of the uh, subscapularis uh, 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 retentioning or or uh, the lower part of subscapularis creating a hammock. You don't have a similar effect when you do a bone block technique. So how do you expect you to get a better result with your technique when the biomechanically it is not the uh, same kind of salvage procedure when you compare mm -hmm. it with Latage? Actually, I don't have bad results. I have the same results, meaning that the, uh, 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 the, the rate of uh, redislocation is the same. And uh, normal shoulder, uh, the stability is not done by the conjoint tendon, but the labrum and the capsule. And so I've explained, if you have a good labrum and good capsule, there is no need of the action of the conjoint tendon. You need the action of the conjoint tendon or the subscap if you have a bad uh, soft tissue, bad uh, uh, labrum. So if you follow my treatment algorithm and you treat patient with bone in the fat or high risk of recurrence because they're young, they're involved in contact sport, and you do your bunker plus bone block, you have the same result than Latogé because those patients, they don't need the action of the conjoint tendon. The, the normal shoulder is stable without the action of the conjoint tendon. You need the action of the conjoint tendon if you cannot rely on your soft tissue anymore. Okay, any question quickly before we go to Franceschi for his last talk? Uh, Roshan, I have one question for uh, Taverna. Uh, meanwhile, yes. Dr. Franceschi, you can share your screen, meanwhile. Uh, yes. Dr. Taverna, good evening. This is Dr. Rajkumar. 
can you hear I, me sure um i saw your technique of doing uh, subscapularis stenodesis at the uh, glenoid correct how different it is from doing uh, uh, stenodesis using uh, long head of biceps Uh, I mean, it, it, the tenodesis uh, um, for this uh, uh, um, augmentation of the subscap actually is not my technique. It's the technique uh, described by Maiotti and Russo. And we did the combination of uh, bone block and uh, subscap uh, tenodesis together. Uh, so actually, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm the best person to explain to you. But anyway... The action of the tenodesis is of uh, the subscap is just the uh, upper part uh, we take uh, uh, following the Mayotte technique only five millimeters of uh, the upper part of the subscap. Before that, you have to check if the subscap is quite uh, um, elastic. And most of the patient uh, that uh, they have shoulder instability, they have some kind of uh, hyperlaxity, and so they have uh, elasticity not only in the, in the labrum and ligament uh, but also in the tendon. And you just put that there. And this work not as a, a, as a fixed uh, tenodesis because uh, uh, in the study they did, I didn't do, with the uh, uh, arthro MRI after three months, one year, two years, they show that uh, little by little this uh, tenodesis detaches, so the tendon goes back to the normal place, but forms a scar tissue between the tendon and the, and, and the bone. So like a neo ligaments. I think this is the way it works. But of course, uh, regarding this, uh, the most expert people who can answer to you is uh, Dr. Maiotti and Professor Russo. Thank you, okay. Dr. Taverna. We, Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Chirag, we should go ahead with next talk. Yes, uh, we should move to the next talk. We're running. Uh, yeah. I, uh, Dr. Yeah, can we? Yeah. You yeah, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mute everyone. And share the. I'll just mute everyone. Just a minute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Please go. All right. Okay. I don't want to repeat the concepts that uh, I thought I explained really very well. So I skip the presentation. I start only with the. Uh, with a case that maybe show again the procedure of arthroscopy Latarche. We talk about the bipolar defect and we have a lot of, of procedure that can uh, help us to deal with this kind of problem. But I think that uh, arthroscopic Latarche can help us uh, when we, we are not able to predict the, the, the condition of the capsule when we are inside the joint. So this is a, a, a CT scan of this patient that uh, was uh, 33 years old, uh, dominant side uh, you know, of a rugby player. Uh, we have uh, calculated a glenoid uh, defect of 15% and uh, at the humeral size, uh, 22%. This is the CD 3D scan reconstruction. This is MRI, after MRI, as you can see here. This is the arthroscopic view. He has a, a mild uh, uh, chondral damage, as you can see here. At first, we bird the uh, heel sacs. We perform the remplissage. We retrieve the suture with the suture retriever at the usual manner with a blank cannula, parking the suture in the blank cannula as I showed you before. And we went on with the procedure because uh, we have planned to perform a Latarge procedure. We, we, we went on with this procedure. This is the cleaning of the rotator interval. It is the, the first procedure we have to make to expose uh, the subacromial space and the coracoid from, uh, from inside. 
and going on. After that, we clean the anterior glenoid rim and we perform an extensive uh, capsulotomy. That is uh, sometimes the key of the success because sometimes it's very difficult to deliver the bone block inside the joint if you have a, a thick capsule. This is, uh, as you can see here, a bone fra bony fragment that is medialized. And we detach the labrum from uh, the fragment. We use the periosteal elevator to help us to expose the, the fragment. And we use the bar to remove the fragment. As uh, Hector suggested us before, uh, the secret of the success is to perform two flat surfaces. The first at the level of the glenoid, and the second one at the level of the coracoid, because uh, maybe this is the, the limit of this procedure. After that, uh, we have inserted an half pipe guide to insert uh, the, um, the guide, uh, the posterior guide for the posterior access portal. We use a different guide, maybe less, uh, less precise than, uh, than the guide of Ettore. This is an hollow drill bit. At the end, we remove the bit and we have a cannula inside the, the glenoid bone. This is the second one, as you can see here. We insert the, again the posterior in the posterior portal, the Visinger road that uh, helps us to the um, to dilate to dislocate the subscapular and after that in the subacromial space we went on to expose the subacromial the um, subscap this is the conjoint tendon It's very important for me to visualize the nerve, as you can see here. And uh, that's why we, we think that uh, would be a dangerous procedure because uh, we are really very close to the nerve in the shoulder. But if you vi visualize the nerve, I think that uh, you are safe. After that, we can start with the split of the suscap. Almost uh, always uh, the same in the same level, exposing the glenoid. It's very important to expose the medial size of the neck of the glenoid because uh, we have to let pass the, the coracoid. For me, this is a very flat anterior ring. After that, we clean the coracoid and, uh, and we detach the tendon of the, of the pectoral, minor pectoral. We try to find the limits above all the, the tip of the coracoid because uh, we have to know where not to go, of course, with our drill and we insert the coracoid guide that showed them before by Ettore.
These are the holes. We went on uh, preparing the coracoid because if we need to arrive to a flat surface that is uh, the key to the success. Because otherwise, uh, if you don't have two matching surfaces, it's almost impossible to let heal the bone. After that, we retrieve the suture from the, from the cannula, from the glenoid. And with this uh, suture retriever to the holes of the coracoid, we remove the suture. Let pass through the coracoid. After that, we let pass the buttons. We use the split of the sous cap. We perform the osteotomy of the coracoid. At the beginning of my experience, I thought always that uh, was impossible to, to have no bleeding from uh, the coracoid osteotomy. But uh, uh, when I started with this uh, experience, I really wondered about it because uh, I didn't uh, realize uh, so much bleeding. We we go we were go, going we were on now with the cleaning of the coracoid process, avoiding any spur. And at the end, we make uh, the passage through the scapularis using a very big grasper that uh, guide the, the bone block to the subscap. Only when I, I was really very sure about the matching of the two surfaces, I stopped the, my procedure. I think that this is uh, the, the, the most difficult part of the procedure to observe that uh, the two surfaces are matching, like in this case. These are the two buttons, as you can see here, in a very safe position for me, very very distant from uh, the glenoid. I try to move in any way the bone block, but uh, doesn't move. Eh? With, uh, this is the conjoint tendon. Sorry. And at the end, you will find the Romax articular, okay? The conjoint tendon. So this case only to show that uh, for me, it would be possible to consider sometimes the, the chance to treat heel sacs and the lethargy. Thank you, Dr. Franceschi. That was a wonderful talk. Is there any question to Dr. Franceschi? Anybody wants to ask a question to Dr. Franceschi? Samir? Yeah. How, how much percentage of osteolysis have you seen in this double button, uh, endo button group? Unfortunately, I started with this experience only since uh, September. So it's, um, it's almost impossible to observe uh, osteolysis. Anyway, I think that the percentage of osteolysis is less than, uh, and I had to ask to iterate if it's real, less than in uh, 
uh, bone block procedure with the xenograft because we have an, an autograft very vascular, vascularized. So I think that should be better. We have to ask it uh, to Ettore that uh, has made uh, both uh, experience. Dr. Franceschi, uh, if, if we know about this adjustable loops and adjustable buttons, they have something known as late and delayed creep. And eventually there is a loosening of this structure when you uh, go for a full range. Because we have studied this in ACL reconstruction in knee. Whenever you do tightening of ACL, there is around one to two millimeter of uh, the uh, yeah bungee effect. Bungee effect, or, effect. yeah. So, so there is a loosening of this uh, tissue, uh, this uh, implant when we use an ACL or PCL. So, do we see a similar effect in this coracoid fixation when you use a similar kind of implant on glenoid, where a healing rate is very very difficult to achieve? But best of the best implants. Really, I had this, uh, this doubt when I started with this procedure because I have had the same uh, feeling sometimes when I use, for example, technique uh, of uh, Artrex company for fixing the, um, the graft in a, for ACL reconstruction. I don't know if you use it, uh, the uh, tightrope uh, technique, no? That is uh, um, devoted only to a knot that you have to tie the, the externally. I think that the feeling of this kind of procedure is completely different. We use, uh, for me, the, um, stronger sutures. We use uh, two more sutures and the uh, knees knot that uh, these, uh, the knot that we use uh, is stronger that uh, the note that we use for ACR reconstruction. And finally, the, ten the use of tension is uh, mandatory to be sure that you have uh, given the right tension to the suture. So these are uh, preliminary experience, preliminary feelings, but sincerely, I really trust in this. Any yes, if questions? I can uh, say something regarding this. Yes, is, Dr. Taverna, yes. Uh, there are two more differences uh, compared to the Artrex device. For, because, for example, Valenti showed a technique uh, for Latage similar, just with one more portal, but uh, the fixing with the Artrex device. Uh, the hole in the coracoid um, with uh, the round and the buttons are smaller. And then the round and the button, the one that they go in the coracoid, they have a peg that enter and is fixed blocked in the coracoid. So you have no rotation, no release. Otherwise, with the Artrex device, you don't have anything by the bone. And so there is always a shearing between uh, uh, the, the, the system and, and the hole of the coracoid. So the combination of a smaller hole and better fixation and uh, stability on the coracoid makes a difference. The posterior buttons, are they don't have a peg because uh, we have seen that um, if you just pull it like this, sometimes the peg can not enter in the hole, so they're flat with a little concavity. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, I mean, to my, in my cases, I didn't see a single CT scan with the posterior buttons not a, properly attached to the to the glenoid, but I think that uh, also Francesco and all the others that they, they, they're approaching to this uh, devices, uh, they don't see any problem with that. So um, the difference is, uh, is mainly due to this, these things. Uh, configuration of devices is different, is a better immediate uh, rotational stability thanks to the uh, design of the anterior buttons. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Yes, yes, Dr. Anto. Yes, Dr. Anto, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Ettore and Dr. Franceschi, what is the difference in the studies alone bone graft vis a vis the Latarje in terms of uh, uh, union, in terms of absorption, and in terms of uh, uh, soft tissue stability? Do you think, uh, Ettore, because you are putting anchors on the glenoid, you have better? soft tissue control on the capsule with the graft or in the uh, in the lethargy it is the conjoint tendon the vascular that makes it better incorporation 
uh, as I said, uh, the bone block, uh, the integration or not depends on the quality of the block. Then uh, if you have a good integration, uh, you have uh, almost all the block after one year that stays there. So you have a better bone integration than the coracoid if you use the proper graft. So this is the first message. So graft, xenograft are better than coracoid. Coracoid, every works published, and also my experience is the upper part of the coracoid, you have resorption. No matter what, uh, what you're going to use, screws, buttons, artworks, myth and nephew, you have resorption of the upper, upper part of the coracoid. So the conjoint tendon maybe helps the bottom part of the coracoid to integrate, but doesn't help the upper part to the, uh, to the coracoid to, the integ to integrate. I have a slight better in bone integration of the coracoid using two buttons instead of two screws. And this is a study we are doing uh, uh, in my hospital, uh, myself and somebody of my team that is still using screws, but uh, still worse than a fine bone. Uh, so Dr. Ettore, why you don't like uh, Rampley size compared to Dr. Francisci? What is your thoughts on that? I didn't say I don't like remplissage. I'm saying I don't like remplissage when she, it, it would be really useful because it's really useful when you have a medial defect on the heel sacs and that's a contraindication because in that case, uh, ordering is not working or if it works, you have a restriction of uh, external rotation. If it's in the lateral side, I think it's uh, to date, maybe the best thing we can do for heel sacs. Although I think future is something that Francesco showed us is, uh, you know, in uh, that piece of bone is missing bone, is not missing tendon. So I think future, we should improve the way we are treating our heel sacs. I think uh, for the moment, it's okay, just okay, remplissage for lateral heel sacs is bad for central uh, and more medial heel sacs. And I think this is an experience that everybody can uh, can have. Uh, Dr. Okay. Francisci? I think there's uh, a last yeah. question, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Francisci, uh, doing an arthroscopic lethargy and arthroscopic remplissage combined procedure, do you think it's a overkill? Yes, 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 absolutely. I really believe it. You are only to start the rehabilitation on a very, very fast to avoid uh, steepness, of course. Think, do you uh, recommend that? Do you, do you recommend, recommend that? Uh, if I can, do you recommend a lethargy plus arthroscopic lethargy? Yes. <laughs> I, I think yes, you should recommend it because one of the worst uh, results of lethargy, if you don't fix uh, the heel sacs, is that this patient maybe doesn't have dislocation, but they have uh, subluxation and pain. And so, you know, the good thing of doing arthroscopically assisted or all arthroscopic latarge is the possibility to add heel sacs uh, uh, remplissage if the heel sacs is lateral. So this is a, 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 good, uh, a good option that I would recommend. If the heel sacs is central, which is quite common also in this patient, okay, in that case, I don't recommend uh, remplissage but not all in, in conjunction with Latalge. I don't recommend uh, remplissage in any case. Okay, I think, gentlemen, that was a wonderful discussion. I'd like to thank uh, both the speaker, my both the friend, Dr. Franceschi, as well as Dr. Etor. Hi, both of you. You uh, really made the topic very easy. I SMSed you very late night. I know it's very difficult time for both of you in Italy, but uh, thank you again from bottom of my heart bottom of my heart. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chirag and Dr. Sanjay is already left, I think, for uh, moderating. And thank you, everyone. I will stop the live, uh, Zoom, uh, live interaction. Now, if you want to 